بسم الله والحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله وعلى آله وصحبه ومن ولا. Uh, I just thought we'd spend 15 minutes just to show you some of the videos. Now, the videos that I have, my videos are not displaying on the screen. They work on here, but they don't display on this back screen. But I have some of the videos of Sheikh Adil, and those are working fine. So we can show you Sheikh's, uh, Sheikh's videos, inshallah. And in the end of the day, the videos are a bonus. And the main thing is that we've learned the right uh, information. And I will try to put my videos, uh, if I can put my videos online, I will try to put them online, inshallah, for people to, to look at. Bi'idhnillahi ta'ala. Okay, this is working out, right? Brilliant. So the first video we're going to show you, let's just start at the very top. Let's start with this video here. What you can see there is a sewer. It's a public sewer. And you can see that the, the, the people are fishing around inside of it. Because they got a phone call to tell them that there is something inside of the sewer. Like that there is some magic inside of the sewer. So they start digging around and they start trying to fish it out. But in the end, they can't, they can't do it. They can't dig it around, they can't fish it out. So what they do in the end is that they actually climb into it. And you're going to see what they bring out. I will just forward it to the bit so you can see, inshallah, what they bring out. Can you see? They bring out copies of the, of the Qur'an. And what they have to do with that, if you're interested about how they clean it up, what they do, they wash it in clean water until there is no more dirt on it. And then they perfume each page. They go page by page and they put perfume on it. So you can see, they got a phone call to tell them that there is some magic that has been hidden in this place and you can see what the magicians had done. They had covered the Quran or put the Quran into a public, into a public sewer. Subhanallah. We told you about the sea and the land and all these different, the, the water magic and the different types of magic. Now you're going to see, inshallah ta'ala, you're going to see, bi'idhnillahi al-kareem, this one is the inside, if I'm not mistaken, it's inside of a grave or it's inside of a cave. The sheikh's got one inside of a grave and the other one inside of a cave. The, video, the new videos I have are in high definition, but these ones are are old ones, but you can see the kind of thing. What's the sheikh bringing out? He's bringing out like a package. This is real magic. It's not like just a little ta'weed that somebody got for, you know, just to change their belief. So you're going to see what's inside of it now. And I want you to observe very carefully what's inside of it. We just go to the bit where Sheikh's going to take out what's inside of it. Okay. It's all covered in something disgusting. There is a, there is a tissue. There is a child's uh, diaper or nappy. There is a bitter lemon. There's, I think there ends up being a sanitary towel in there. There are some lemons. There is the skull of the bird's head in there. And the pins. You see the pins that are the pins that are jammed into the uh, the lemon. Why is the bird's head in there? There's a sacrifice to other than Allah, and it's all smeared in blood. This animal was sacrificed to other than Allah Subhanahu wa Taala, and the lemon symbolizes bitterness, and uh, and usually a, 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 you know, I think it's a bitter woman. And they're going to pull out of the, um, the lemon or whatever, these pins. They have some things with uh, amulets and things written on it. And it's all in together. So one, count the pins. Seven. So what was this done for? Seven. 
Seven is aligned with the seven stars of Babylon. For it was done to actually cause someone to love somebody. And in the end, I don't know if the Sheikh's going to show some more. So he's counting the pins. I believe it was done to make someone love someone. But in, when we say love someone, it doesn't mean like something good happened out of it. And it would be to break up a marriage and bring the person to someone else or something like that. And the Sheikh explained, and, and I think in other videos I've explained it in more, in more details. Okay. Just to show you another example, we've covered the earth, and now we're going to see the example of the... Okay, this one was uh, an example of what one of the magicians does, just to show you like, the way that they would learn. We used to show you this before. And this one was definitely working before, so let's see where it's gone. I think it's this one. Let's bring it back. Okay, so what can you see? See a circle of stones? You can see the different candles. How many candles? Seven candles. Each candle color has a significance. Each colored candle has a particular significance for them. And they are... Use, they have built a little altar to worship the shaitan. And the guy would sit in there and he would not be allowed to leave. All these like symbols on the walls and stuff like that. Pentagrams and names of shaitan and things like that on the wall. He would typically light the candles and he would sit and he would not be allowed to move from that space. Even the toilet, he would have to do, do in the same place and sit. And obviously, they don't allow him to do anything. They're just getting him to show. Like, they caught him, and they're just asking him to show what he would do. And he would remember the shaitan. Remember the names of the shaitan and read the names of the, of the shaitan. And he's telling what each, uh, what each candle, what each candle would be and what each candle what each candle would do. Let's see if this one is going to open or not. Okay, this is the sea one. They're pulling this stuff out of the sea. Why is it in the sea? Because they calculate, the magician calculated that this person is a water person. This is a water, uh, like an issue of water, so you can see. These people are out after the Hajj period in Jeddah. And all of those peace of Allah people came to the Hajj and they put magic in the sea. So they're dredging, they're actually going through and they're, they're dragging out the, they're dragging out the, uh, the stuff on the sea. And inside, you're going to find a lot of different uh, ta'weez. I'm going to see if I can show you one quickly. Okay, you can see this. This doesn't look nice. There's a box. Inside of it is some soil that has been, uh, maybe some mud, and certain things have been uh, put inside of it. There's, you can see this is like some sort of book. Can you see that? It's difficult to see because the videos are not in, uh, these, these are old videos, and they're a little bit uh, difficult to see. But inside you can see there's like a book, and the book is wrapped in knots. And you can see they're taking the rope off of the book. What did we say the first thing is? We remove the knots from the ta'weez. So we just show you some of the stuff they're going to find, some nasty stuff inside. And like, I would not advise you guys to be doing this without gloves and just with a knife in your hand and just, you know, chopping away. I, really, you should have gloves on and... Stuff like that. And you can see the actual ta'weed is there. It's, it's been put inside of it. You can see that paper. That paper is, a, is one of the ta'weed that we saw on the pictures, like one of the ones we saw on the pictures. So it's got all the symbols on and the names of the shaitan and the numbers and all of that stuff. And you got some knots and some blood and some, yeah, not very nice stuff. This one is a very strange one. So they're tracking, they're tracking a guy who is... 
يعني a magician or is going on behalf of a magician. So they're, they're tracking the person. يعني they ch- they're going to chase him or they're going to arrest him and they're going to see what he's got in the car. So they're going to bring this person out, they're going to see what he's got in the car. Okay, can you see what it is? It's a black goat, of some, something like a goat. And basically, it was there because it was going to be sacrificed in the bathroom at Maghrib. It was going to be sacrificed in the bathroom at Maghrib to please the to please the shaitan and to seek nearness to seek nearness to the shaitan. So they came into the the, the sheikhs they came into the grave and they've been told they received a phone call to tell them which grave it's buried in. And you can see what they're going to bring out. Okay, what does that look like to you? If I just pause that there, what does that look like to you? It's the same letters that we saw. It's the same information that we learned about when we learned about how they make the ta'weez. It's the same thing people put around their necks and say this is the Qur'an, this is the names of Allah, and so on. And you can see that, that the name of the person is written there. The name of the person it's for, and these different things, Allah, and other things are written on there, but this was buried in the grave. This is exactly what magic is like. Exactly what magic is like. Yeah, so this is another magician, and he's showing how he calls upon the shaitan. They're not going to let him uh, actually do it, but they're going to force him to show what he would do. So you see he's wearing red. Why is he wearing red? Because what is it not allowed for the men to wear? Red. So he's wearing it to disobey Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And he's going to dress up in his thing. And he's lighting his bukhur to call upon the shaitan. Then he's going to take a whip. He's going to perfume himself and he's going to whip himself. Over and over and over again. So he would whip himself. And he would take a cockerel and he would cut its throat and make it spill the blood all over the walls. These walls are covered in blood. Because he took a cockerel and he slaughtered it to to the shaitan and he spilled the blood on every wall. And then what he would do to conclude, and they're not going to allow him to do it, they're going to stop him before he does it, but he would make sajda to the shaitan. He would make sujood to the shaitan and then when he did that, the shaitan would appear before him and the shaitan would perform some of the actions that he asked them to perform. But as we said, in the end, what's going to happen is the shaitan is not going to be content with that. He has to bring other people. He has to bring new people to do the same, to do the same thing. We show you one about the sheikhs opening some stuff up. Okay, so we're just trying to show you this from the beginning. How, what is the sheikh going to do? So what's he got there? Razor blade. And what's he going to do? The knots. He's going to cut the knots open. And he's going to go knot by knot. Make sure the knot is cut open. All the time they're reciting the Qur'an. But you don't recite the Qur'an over uh, like impure substances. So if you find blood or urine or stool, you, don't, you stop reciting the Qur'an until you cleaned it. Because it's not right to recite the Qur'an over that stuff. Okay. So what's the sheikh got now? He's got a... A leather pouch. 
and he's going to open the leather pouch. I have videos of me doing this on YouTube, which are better quality as well. Uh, but the Sheikh's got more varied stuff because I don't record all the videos. I just have a couple of uh, opening it up. So you can see it's kind of like it's kind of like locked inside of the pouch. Then you get inside and you start to see what's there. Sheikh's keeping everything on a big uh, sheet that he's going to get rid of in the end. Okay, what's inside of here? Okay. Don't do that with a knife like that. Okay, get to the same symbols, the same stuff that we've seen before, the circles with the names inside, the exact same stuff that we've seen before. Let's forward it. Have a look at what's in this one. So you get a plastic bag. Why the plastic bag? The plastic bag is there to stop the magic from disappearing or decaying in the earth. You see that pink writing? That's the one you have to wash before you burn it because it's usually meant for the water. It's the saffron or the you know, pink color writing. So you see what Sheikh's going to do? He's going to wash it first. He's going to wash it first. He's going to blow. What's he doing now? He's blowing the Quran into the water. And... You're going to see, he's going to rub the, rub the writing off till the writing dissolves in the water. The water, you can't just throw it down the drain. You have to dispose of it. You have to dispose of it in a, in a place where people don't go so that it doesn't harm the people. And you see in there, this is to burn. So this is one of the ones to burn because you can see the incense is in there. Wash it as well. The burn and the water ones, we wash. And look how he's going to rub the words off using the water till the words are completely gone. And then he's going to dry the pieces out and burn them after that. Okay. More knots and razor blades. The reason we use a razor blade on the knot is these knots are so small that you can't easily, you can't easily open them. So we just cut them in half. Okay. That's given us a little bit of an idea. And uh, we have some, we'll try and link it to you when we give you the notes to some a little bit uh, better quality ones of the video, but for some reason the high quality ones I have did not want to display on the TV behind. So we suffice ourselves with that, inshallah ta'ala. Okay. We have now an hour approximately in which we need to finish the questions and then we can have our demo, our Rukia demo, inshallah ta'ala. So we need to go through these questions. I'm going to take them in the order they've been given to me. So these ones, if you keep them the next set aside, if we have time for them, we will do them, inshallah. Okay. Okay. So before I start, if everyone gives me their full attention, please. What I'm going to do, inshallah ta'ala, is I'm going to answer them quite quickly because otherwise we will not get through everybody's question. So we want to answer them quickly. Okay. Why is it that my body gets extremely warm when I wake up from sleep? What did we say about symptoms? Do you remember we said about symptoms? They could be medical. They could be Rukia related. So what would we tell the sister to do? We would tell her, start the Rukia program and go to the doctor. If the doctor doesn't find anything, see if it reacts to the Rukia. And then from there, we can make a diagnosis. But we're not going to say that there's a gin problem until we start the process. First, we're going to say, yes, start the rukia, put the oil, put the water, do the seven-day program. Does it get better? Does it get less? And then let the, you know, do the medical investigation as well and see how does Allah Azza wa Jal open a door for you. Is it possible for mankind and jinn kind to reproduce together? This is something the scholars differed over. I think intimacy is something that there's, it's quite clear that they can have intimacy. But 
I, I don't think that there's an evidence that you can get these half men, half jinn children. I think this is, and it doesn't have an evidence for it. How can I distinguish between being possessed and affected by magic? That's a very good question. I would say that the best way of distinguishing would be to take a case history, to look at what is going on, and to, inshallah ta'ala, uh, take into account all of the factors. So when you're doing the investigation, you start the case history, you do the ruqya, you find out more about what happened, eventually you will come to know. And I know that sounds like a very, that sounds like a very basic explanation, but you really don't need anything more than that. And in the first place, you're going to use the same method, inshallah ta'ala. Your ruqya method at a basic level is not going to change. Okay, a small child had an incident where his leg got burnt, and as a result, there's a scar left. Could ruqya be performed on the scar? And if so, how can we go about this? That's a very good question. I think ruqya can be performed, but I don't know how to do it. Uh, I would suggest trying uh, ruqya water and ruqya oil to start with and experiment. And, and when you find out what works, inshallah ta'ala, let us know so that we can advise it for other people. Every now and then I feel tightness in the thigh area. Could this be related to the jinn? Again, it's a symptom. It's a symptom. But we can't say that this symptom is a jinn symptom until we do much, much more research. I want you guys to really learn this really well. Someone comes to you and says, I have a headache. We say to them, it's possible. Start the ruqya, do the program, go to the doctor, try to find it out. Inshallah, one way or the other, Allah Azza wa is going to show you what the problem is. Once a victim gets possessed by a jinn, how can he or she be sure that the jinn has left the body? This is an excellent question. May Allah Azza wa reward you. This is a fantastic question. I have an article on my website, which I'm going to actually show you because it's such a good question. I'm actually going to show you the article. I think it's extremely, extremely important to show you this article. So how am I going to show you the article? Let me figure it out. I'm going to switch this to my phone. And okay, that's working. And then I'm going to open this. And we're going to do, how do I know my treatment is complete? Okay, good. Load that up. Okay, perfect. And now we're going to switch it back to the display on the back. It's an excellent question. And put the display back on. Whoops. Good. Okay. How do I know that my treatment is complete? My answer. In my opinion, Rukia is only judged as having been completely successful when the person experiences no further symptoms and has been blessed with complete relief from the problem they were suffering from. This usually happens in phases, meaning it's usually not like possessed, not possessed. It's a slow process of getting better and certain things happen. And in some ways, the latter stages of treatment is one of the most important times for Rukia and one of the times that people make the most mistakes. Every case is different and not everyone experiences a phase where things feel better. Some people simply build up to a point where the reaction is the strongest and then the jinn leave. However, there are some very important points to bear in mind. Number one, do not stop ruqya. Once the jinni leaves, people often stop treatment. I recommend one full month of ruqya before you say that the person is better. This can be because the jinn is fooling you into thinking they've gone, or because the jinni has left and another one becomes active. It also catches cases where the jinn returns back to the person. So you don't have to, as a raqi, you don't have to read on them, but you make sure someone is reading on them for about a month. Point number two, don't accept 90%. A lot of people get 90% better and they stop. 
because they think that it's good enough. The affliction has the chance to grow and flourish again. If you had cancer, you would not be content to stop with 90% because you know the 10% will grow again. The same thing with the jinn. Don't stop at 90%. Number three, different phases mean different modes of attack for the shaitan to take advantage of. If one door closes for the shaitan, he'll move on to another method. So it may be that the shaking stops. So in the beginning, shaking. You read one week, shaking stops. But then the whispering starts. I can hear voices. One week, the whispering stops. Then the person says, I don't feel like praying. One week, and then they start praying again. And you see what I mean? It goes in phases. So you have to remain constant and patient in tackling the problem and the importance of consistency. And once the problem is gone, the person remains vulnerable. Point number four. This is like a medical patient who has just undergone surgery. When they come out of surgery, they are vulnerable to illness and infection. The same thing in Rukia. When they finish the Rukia, they are vulnerable to getting infected again. So continue the Rukia, bi'idnillahi ta'ala, for a significant period after the person is better and start protecting them, giving them the ways of protection, dhikr, adhkar, the prayers, the belief, all of the things that we talked about to build up their strength until they are able, inshallah ta'ala, to, uh, to manage uh, on their own. Okay. Do we have to say Bismillah every time we read into the water or oil? Um, should we say Ameen after Surah Al-Fatiha? And should we say Bismillah in Surah Al-Fatiha? We should say Bismillah as part of Surah Al-Fatiha because many of the scholars consider that Bismillah is the first ayah in Surah Al-Fatiha. Uh, so it's better that you read it. And uh, you should say A'udhu Billah at the beginning of the reading. So you start... A'udhu billahi minash shaytanir rajeem Bismillahir rahmanir rahim And then you read, and when you finished Walad dhanin Ameen Bismillahir rahmanir rahim Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen, and so on. Okay. When the mother is afflicted, her children may inherit the sihr or not, or can it cause disturbances to them, or could they get afflicted? If the mother sleeps near to the child, is it harmful to the child? That's an amazing question. Okay. First of all, magic may be passed on uh, in the womb sometimes. We have seen cases of this that appears to happen. However, it's not clear to me, is the magic really passed on or is it the case that the magic was actually done to the whole family? So I'll show you what I mean. Uh, if I have my... So, it's, we have a mother who has magic. And then we see that her newborn child also starts to have a reaction. It's possible that this was passed during the child's development in the womb. This is one possibility. But the other possibility is that it was done on the whole family to start with. That the magic wasn't actually done on the mother. The magic was actually done on the whole family. So to me, it's not clear whether it's this one or whether it's this one. But it is possible that the kids become afflicted. Nearness doesn't make any difference. Being near doesn't make a big difference. When you're near to someone that has magic, you might get disturbed, but you won't get necessarily afflicted. But you might get, you might get some disturbance. Like you just don't feel right. You, don't, like you feel like a bit... And when you do Rukia, this happens too. You get a little bit of disturbance. So you're doing Rukia on someone and you're just like, oh, you know, I don't feel right. I feel a bit... You know, but just read on yourself and it will go. It will go in, in a minute or two minutes. It's, it's not a big deal. Can we hang frames or posters with the ayat, ayat al-kursi written on it? 
No, we shouldn't do this because Allah Azza wa said, Don't take the ayat of Allah as a joke or a decoration or a game. And it's not a way of protecting yourself. What if you're not fluent in reciting the Quran, but you have to recite Surah Al-Baqarah? Can you play it? Well, what you can do is a couple of things. First of all, you don't have to recite Surah Al-Baqarah. You could recite Al-Fatiha and the small surahs. Secondly, you could listen to the tape and repeat. There's something called, uh, what do they call it? They call it Al-Mus'haf uh, Al-Mu'allim, I think. So it's where you have the, the Qari reads, for example, he would read, Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen. And then they leave a space. And then you read, Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen. And then he says, Ar-Rahmanir Rahim. And then he leaves a space. And they have, you can download these and you can read after them. Audio on the PC is not the same as Rukia. It may help, but it's not the same. Is it true before moving into a new house, you should recite Surah Al-Baqarah to get rid of the jinn? No, I don't think this is, a, this is not like to me. Uh, it's, not, uh, it's not necessary, but generally, you should read the Quran in your house as, as a whole, yani, in general. Is it wrong to walk by the cemetery with young children? No, I don't think there's anything wrong with that. But you should keep your children indoors between Maghrib and Isha, if you can, because the Prophet ﷺ said, إِنَّ لِلشَّيْطَانِ intisharan wa khatfah. The shaitan spreads out and snatches people between Maghrib uh, and Isha. Can the evil eye affect thyroid function? Definitely. The evil eye can affect any part of your medical well-being. How do you convince a person to stop wearing a ta'weeth? So what you need to do when you want to convince anyone of something is you need to follow certain steps. One thing you need to do is you need to do your research. You need to get your proof. And you need to present it with wisdom. So these are three key steps. Do your research. Don't just, you know, like say, oh, you should stop wearing a ta'weed because Muhammad Tim said. You know, like, or oh, Muhammad Tim showed me a video. That's not an evidence. Do your research. I've got videos, articles, lectures, and I'm not the only one. Maybe there are 10, 20 brothers. They have videos, they have lectures, they have explanations. Do your research. Get your dalil, your proof. The Prophet ﷺ said, مَن تَعَلَّقَ تَمِيمَةً فَقَدْ أَشْرَكْ Whoever hangs a ta'weeth has committed shirk, has made a partner with Allah. And the Prophet ﷺ said, مَن, مَن تَعَلَّقَ تَمِيمَةً فَلَا أَتَمَّ اللَّهُ لَهُ Whoever hangs an amulet, may Allah never give him his, what he wants from it. And so on. And he said, مَن تَعَلَّقَ تَمِيمَةً وُكِلَ إِلَيْهِ Whoever hangs a, uh, an amulet will be, will be uh, entrusted to it. So one you can find in different places. You could, for example, have a look at uh, articles online. Or you could just get a copy of Kitab al-Tawheed, for example, and look at the chapter on amulets. There's a lot of evidence uh, in there as well, inshallah ta'ala. And present it with wisdom. Present it with wisdom. You can't just say to somebody, you know what it is? And I found it in Kitab al-Tawheed. They're going to say, see, I knew you're one of those people. You read that book, Kitab al-Tawheed. You see, you've been brainwashed by these people into thinking that these ta'weeds are evil. Don't you know the Sahaba used to read, used to have ta'weeds? All of this is answered on my website. I have a nice refutation article from those people who say that the Sahaba used to wear ta'weeds. And you can go through it, inshallah ta'ala. And there are some proofs in there. But present with wisdom with wisdom. Very important. Okay. If you're experiencing sleep paralysis and you see a shadow every other night, could this be sihr? The key word is this word. Could. Could. I would suggest that if you are seeing shadows and you're experiencing sleep paralysis, this is almost certainly related to the jinn. Because we have two factors now. Number one, we have the factor of we're seeing sort of thing, we're seeing things, we, we are seeing things that we shouldn't normally be able to see. So we're seeing paranormal sort of activity. And the second thing is 
sleep paralysis. So we have two evidences now. If it was one of them on its own, we could say maybe, maybe not. But now we have two. Maybe if you spoke to the person, the person would have three or four or five or six. So now we start to say, yeah, it needs Rukia treatment. The same treatment I've described to you. You can take the video, the simple guide video. You can do the seven-day program. You can take the simple guide video. You can follow it for yourself. You don't need to go to Iraqi. And inshallah, within the family, you can follow it. Or one of your friends who has come to the class today can help you with it, inshallah ta'ala. As you treat, you will get more knowledge. See, the initial treatment, you don't know very much. So what happens with your knowledge of what's going on is your knowledge increases over time. Your knowledge about what's happening over time. It gets more. So in the beginning here, you don't know what's going on, but you think something's wrong because there's sleep paralysis and the people are seeing some paranormal visions. Okay, when we start doing more Rukia, we end up here. We think, yeah, we are seeing more signs of magic coming out. It seems like it's not a jinn issue. It might be a magic issue. And then here, and then here. As we get towards the end of the treatment here, we have a lot more knowledge about what is going on and what is actually happening. What should we do if we hear voices at home and things moving on their own? The best advice I have for you is three things. Number one, I'm, I'm going to put it this way. I'm going to say purify your home. Purify your home. What I mean is get rid of the haram and bring the, bring the halal, bring the wajib, bring the fard, bring the sunnah. But get rid of the haram. Number two, Surah Al Baqarah in the home. And generally, and the Quran in general in the home. Reading. And number three, this is the most, one of the most important ones. This is my number one advice for people who have problems in the home. This on its own solves the problem. Usually, don't be scared. One of the things that I actually uh, did recently is I got a call that someone was having these things moving around and switching the taps and closing the doors. The only thing I said is don't be scared and the problem stopped. Because the shaitan is doing it because he knows he gets a reaction from you. He knows you get like worried about it or people in the family get worried about it. If he moves your furniture, move it back. He'll stop doing it. Stop doing it. Bi'idhnillahi ta'ala. Okay. Okay. I'm going to deal with this one, inshallah ta'ala, later. It's a little bit more complicated. Okay. Can we read the ayat of Shifa near a person or child who is having a general sickness. Of course you can. If a woman is afflicted with jinn possession and she's doing everything she can, she's learning the Quran and she's doing many good deeds, but the husband is lacking, missing fajr, delaying prayers, will it prevent the shifa for the woman? That's a good question. The reality is that that's a difficult question to answer. It doesn't help, but it's also not her fault. She needs to do her best to encourage him not to fight with him. Don't fight with him and say, you know, you're the reason why I'm not getting Shifa and it's all your fault and this is why I told you that you're just helping the shaitan and oh, this is not good. Instead, help him to be better. Perhaps Allah is giving this sickness for the wisdom of the husband becoming a better Muslim. Uh, when I'm on the verge of wakefulness from the sleep, the jinn often takes over and causes disturbances. How do you get rid of this? It's true, that is a time when a lot of people get that problem. The olive oil might help. Uh, there's a couple of things might help. The olive oil uh, may help before you go to uh, sleep. And likewise, if it's, if it's a deep sleep, uh, not in the naps, if it's a deep sleep, then possibly try doing a rukia bath. I've got the instruction on my website for that. 
before going to sleep. But this one is not so much because it's, it's more, you try the olive oil, inshallah. But if you're just napping, like, for example, you're just, like, you're, you're normally talking, just, like, napping like that, it needs more ruqya. Is there benefit to listening to ruqya audio from a headset? There's a benefit, but it's not like ruqya. Okay. And the intense fear of death because of, and panic attacks. How do you get rid of this? Ayat of Sakina would be a good place to start. The ayat of Sakina and study, gain knowledge. The more knowledge you gain and the ayat of Sakina, inshaAllah ta'ala.